Hi, um, as Rika said, my name is Julia Wester and I'm the co-founder of 55 Degrees, a lean agile training and product company. And we have a booth here. So if you find yourself with a few free minutes, you don't know what to do with. And especially if this talk whets your appetite, which is about what I'm gonna do in 30 minutes, um, please come by and talk to me. I'd love to just chat about this or anything else you want to. Um, at Actionable uh, at uh, 55 Degrees, our flagship app is Actionable Agile Analytics. And that means I'm constantly talking about flow metrics and forecasting, and today is gonna be no different. So I wanna to talk to you today about how to be able to navigate this crazy uncertain world of work we live in to provide forecasts that are both reliable and risk aware, okay? So the first thing we have to talk about before you can even buy into the fact uh, of most of what I'm gonna talk about today is the fact that we live in uncertain times. So I think that many of you have seen this uh, before, but I bet most, if not all of you have at least felt this when you're delivering work in these complex environments we all work in. You know, we do all of this planning and we think I want you to do this this way. And you think everyone understands. And then you turn around and it's delivered and you're like, that's not at all what I talked about. Or why, you know, why can't this be delivered when I said it would be, when you said it would be, you know, we have the schedule, right? And even when we put our best efforts in, we can't always guarantee that things will turn out exactly the way we want or even exactly when we want it. And we want it to be that way. We want to be able to say those things. But if we lived in worlds of absolute certainty, especially at work, we wouldn't need things like Agile and Scrum. You know, those things are uh, things whose purposes are to help us iterate through uncertainty because we know that we can't do big upfront planning. We don't even know what we want to deliver yet many times. So we have all of these constructs to help us go through uncertainty to come out the other end and end with the right thing. And, you know, we like to think that we understand that we don't always know what we wanna deliver, but still sometimes we can think, okay, we have all this uncertainty, but I can still give you a precise, accurate forecast and be 100% certain and it's going to be delivered in that time and just doesn't logically make sense. And so I want to talk about uncertainty in terms of something Stephen Bungay in his book, The Art of Action calls the three gaps. But before we have to, before we can talk about the gaps, we have to talk about the thing that the gaps are in. And it's this sort of circular mindset where we have, where we say, okay, I want these particular outcomes, right? And so we think about the outcomes we want. We make the best plans we can make. We execute on those plans in the precise way we laid it out. And then we think if we take those actions just like we laid it out, we get the outcomes we want and success, right? But as I alluded to, that doesn't always happen because of these three gaps he talks about. And the first is between outcomes and plans. And that's called the knowledge gap. And this knowledge gap is the difference between what we would like to know, what we can even know at all at this point in time, versus what we would actually like to know. And if we acknowledge that we can't know everything up front, then you're already agreeing to the fact that you cannot make perfect plans. If you can't know everything, you cannot plan your way out of your complexity. It's just not possible. So we have to sort of start letting that go. And even if we could make the perfect plans, then we fall into the next gap, which is the alignment gap. And this is the difference between what we want people to do and what they actually do. Because we can't control people. People are not automatons. And even if we could program them, we don't know enough about them specifically to program them perfectly, okay? Let's assume we can make perfect plans and we could program them perfectly we can still fall into the third gap, which is the effect gap. And that is the difference between what we expect our actions to achieve and what they actually end up achieving. Have you ever done the same thing multiple times, the same exact way and gotten different outcomes occasionally? We can't ever fully predict how the environment around us, whether it's people, systems, etc. how that will all react to what we do. So it means we can't know in advance exactly what our actions that we do to execute our plan, if they'll 
actually have 100% of the time the desired effect. So we have to start retraining our brain. We know we live in complexity. We know we live in uncertainty, but we still think we can make these perfect plans and execute perfect actions to get our perfect outcome. So the first lesson is that we need to start letting that sort of go. But the first thing that we tend to do when something doesn't go the way that we want is to try to do it even more deeper, harder. We just didn't do it well enough. So let's do it more. So it's like this door here. It's like, how many signs are we gonna put on the door before we know people are not gonna take the action that we want them to take, right? Um, and so when we're talking about forecasting, well, you know, it didn't quite happen when we wanted it. So next time we're gonna double down on work breakdown. We're going to get more people to come figure out exactly what we need to do so we can figure out exactly how long it will take. And we are going back to thinking we can make perfect plans and perfect outcomes. So, you know, we want to be able to say this with 100% certainty, but we have to keep reminding ourselves that we live in complexity. We can never be certain in complexity. So we can't give this deterministic forecast. And what a deterministic forecast is, is one in where we only let people know about one possible outcome. We might be aware that there are others, but we're only saying it'll be done by X date with no understanding of how likely or unlikely that is to happen, okay? So what we're gonna be talking about in this talk is how to move away from you know, this falsity that we can be deterministic and instead learn how to work within the uncertainty instead of trying to get rid of it. And the way that we do that, especially from a forecasting perspective is by moving from deterministic to probabilistic forecasts. So the first lesson of uncertainty is that when you know when there's more than one possible outcome, you can't rely on deterministic forecasts anymore. Okay, so anytime, any project you're thinking about right now, if you can right now say more than one outcome could happen, you need to go to probabilistic forecasting. But fortunately, it's a pretty easy thing to do. Okay, and a probabilistic forecast is one that not only tells people a possible outcome, but gives our confidence in that answer. And that confidence takes into account some risk. Let's talk about what makes up a probabilistic forecast, because there are two components to every probabilistic forecast, okay? The first one's in the name. It's a probability, okay? You may also hear this referred to as a likelihood or a confidence level. That's when we say there's an 85% chance or I'm 85% certain, or there's an 85% probability that something will happen, okay? So let's talk about the something. That something is generally expressed in a range. So there's an 85% chance that we'll finish this piece of work in 14 days or less. There's an 85% chance that we'll finish 20 or more things this sprint, right? Uh, so it's the days or less, X number of things or more, okay? Um, we're not saying that something will finish on a precise day or that we'll finish a precise number of items uh, in a given time. Now, these two things work together to help the listener understand that we have these multiple possible outcomes. Uh, but here, even knowing that, here's how confident we can be that will fall within the range that I'm giving you. So if I tell you that I'm 85% certain we'll finish this item in 14 days or less, that means there's an 85% chance this will take anywhere from less than one to 14 days to get done. Right, so there's some flexibility in that range, but there's also the understanding that there's a 15% chance that the outcome could fall outside of that range. It could be 15 days or more, okay? And the way that we can sort of get a little more buy-in into this reality that we have to talk in ranges and we have to talk in probabilities is because we're giving people the conservative part of the range as a real number. So it's not like I'm saying that there's an 85% chance that this will take 14 days or more. I'm saying there's an 85% chance that it will take 14 days or something you'll like even better, right? We'll finish, there's an 85% chance we'll finish 20 things or a number you'll like even more than that, okay? 
So those are the two pieces of a probabilistic forecast. And those two pieces together especially help us give an idea to people about the risk or the possible outcomes that we're trying to navigate. And that can drive a whole lot of discussions uh, that you know, we, can, we can talk about either you know, unpack more throughout this talk or in Q&A or at the booth later. But the first question you might be thinking of is how do you go about giving a probabilistic forecast? Well, you're going to need some historical data because what we're going to do is that we're going to look at what you've been able to do in the past as the data set for what you'll likely be able to do in the future. As they say, if you haven't been able to do it so far, what do you think you're gonna do differently now? So if your data shows you that you can get something done in Y number of days, you know, unless you do something differently, that's probably still your reality, right? Um, there are two types of forecasts that we generally get asked to give. Multiple item forecasts like, um, how, you know, when will this big group of work be done or how many items can I get done in X period of time? And then there's single item forecasts. How long will it take me to get this one thing done? And in this talk, we'll cover single item forecasts and you can come talk to me later to go beyond and talk about multi-item forecasts. So you can determine single item forecasts by analyzing a flow metric called cycle time, okay? And cycle time is just the elapsed calendar time between one point of your process and another point of your process, okay? And you can decide which two points you're measuring between. For the purposes of this talk, let's just say from start to finish, whatever that means to you, okay? So when I look at our cycle times, I'm looking at the elapsed time that an individual piece of work took to get done from start to finish. Okay. So you can see this chart here. It's called a cycle time scatter plot. And it has a bunch of dots on it. And those dots represent one or more work items. And the coordinate in which they're plotted is from the horizontal axis is the day that they pass that finish point, the day that they're done. And the vertical axis where they're plotted, the height at which they're plotted is how old it was when it was finished. Right. So was it 20 days? Was it 40 days? 40 days will be higher than 20. Okay. Now, you can get a lot from looking at this. You can see a lot of patterns and have a lot of discussions about what happened when and why did this cluster here and why did that happen there? And why are these outliers there? There's a lot to unpack in this chart, but we're gonna look at how to take all of this data in the aggregate and understand the probability of how long it will take you to finish one more dot, okay? And the way that we do this, let's pretend that there's a hundred dots on this chart or a hundred work items represented by the dots on this chart. If I want to figure out the average, say the 50th percentile, when, uh, you know, of how long it takes 50% of our work to be done, then I can just count from the bottom till I find the dot that represents the 50th percentile line. And I can draw a line and say, okay, 50% of the dots on this chart were finished in seven days or less. So I could assume, that given you know, some caveats that we'll talk about soon, um, that when I start a new piece of work, there's a 50% chance that it'll take seven days or less, okay? Well, 50% is just as wrong as it is, right? Um, we can keep doing this with any percentile as long as we can calculate um, how many dots is 90% or 85%, we can find the place. So if, if we're looking for our 85th percentile, and we've got a hundred dots, we count up from the bottom till we found the 85th dot and we just draw a line. So this is something that you can actually do by hand. If you know the time something took and you know when it finished, you can make the dots on this chart, you can count, you can divide, you can do percentages. It's not really tricky math. I mean, you probably don't wanna do it by hand, but you can. So you don't need any special tools to do this type of forecasting, okay? Now, although it's pretty easy, what is a little bit trickier is choosing the idea of how do I choose my probability, right? So how do I choose whether I want to use the 50th percentile or the 85th percentile, okay? And there's no magic formula for that. We have to take into account our context. And the first thing that we have to remind ourselves, because by the time we get here, we forget that we can't be certain. And we have to remind ourselves that 100% is not an option, 
right? Now, we can't ever be 100% certain, 100% certain if we're trying to forecast based on our best past data, because something can always happen that's never happened before, right? Our data set doesn't account for every possible thing that could happen, it accounts for everything that has happened so far, right? So we can't be 100%, we have to let that go, but we often want to be as close as possible. So let's walk through some a little bit of the thought process here. Okay, so 50%, uh, that's like a coin flip. You're wrong as often as you're right. So that's probably not going to make anyone happy, right? But then what if I try to go the other way and I'm like, I want to be as close to 100% as possible, right? So maybe 98, 99, 95 even. But we have to remember the higher we go, the more outliers that that forecast has to account for. And so your range can get pretty wide, especially if your system is not very predictable. If you, if you finish with lots of different cycle times and it's not very controlled yet. Talk about that in a second. So you have to think about these things, right? Because if we try to get 98, 99 percentile, and basically what you're saying is that anything that's ever happened before, yeah, that's, that's our forecast. So let me just look at the worst thing we ever had happen. And I'll tell you that and we'll be good. So generally, it's gonna be somewhere in between that you wanna find uh, and give as your forecast. So we have to find something that we feel is, well, the Swedish word is logum, sort of just the right balance, right? Um, and one of the things that my go-to question is, and there, you can come up with many questions. Like I said, there's no one right formula, but I like to ask, uh, what's the repercussion of falling outside of the range? The worse the repercussions are, the higher percentile you want to use, even though that means some of your estimates are padded a little bit, some of your forecasts are padded. Um, the less the, you know, the rebound effect of the repercussion, the lower percentile that you can use. Um, you just have to make a choice and then sort of use it for a little while and, and, and adjust, inspect and adapt, okay? Okay, now I mentioned that if you try to pick a really high percentile, like I want to be 90% certain or 95% certain, well, your happiness with the forecast you'll have to give depends a lot on how predictable you are right now, okay? So if your dots are just spread all over the place, and we know there are forecast container range, especially, you know, like uh, X days or less, and you're going to have a lot of options in there. And um, you, you know, you can have a lot of things that take one day, but you're saying 14 days or less. So that can make you less than happy. So we want to focus on um, improving our predictability. And fortunately, you can also see a glimpse at how predictable your system is by looking at the same chart, the cycle time scatter plot, because predictability and delivery times is the consistency of cycle times over the time. The narrower the band, you can make your dots appear, the more predictable you are just by definition. So in this blue area here, we're more predictable than we are in the pink area, right? And then after that, we get a little more predictable again. So we wanna start managing our work and the way that we do work to create more predictable cycle times so that we don't have to do a lot of uh, gymnastics to give forecasts that are both reliable and risk aware, okay? So how do we do that? Like I'm making that sound super easy, right? And there's a lot of things that go into making your cycle times more predictable so that you can give reliable risk aware forecast in minutes instead of hours and days and weeks and spend more time doing the work instead of forecasting the work. And by far, the most important thing that I suggest that you focus on is managing the age of your work, okay? Now, when I started learning about processes and you know, ways to improve our outcomes, the first thing you learn, especially if you're learning about Kanban, um, is to limit your work in progress, okay? And that is a really important thing that I would say even more important than starting with limiting your width is starting by paying attention to the age of your work in progress and managing that. And I wanna show you why, and I'm gonna show you um, how to look at the age of the existing work in the context of your historical data. 
Because if I was to tell you this item is 12 days old, you're like, great, 12 days, that sounds, is it good or bad? I don't, I don't know without any context, right? So if I look at the, uh, this aging work in progress chart, I pulled the one from Actionable Agile, but again, you can make your own. Um, how we've set this up is we have columns here. The horizontal axis is, is like looking at your board, but instead of cards, you have dots. So each dot represents an item of work. Now, how high it is on this charty board is uh, how old the item is. So uh, it doesn't have a cycle time yet. So it's not finished, but it's the age since it entered the board, the age since it started. So the higher dots are older than the other dots, right? Okay. Now, if we take our percentile lines from our cycle time scatter plot, and we don't have to worry about just the one that we care about. That would be good, but we can bring them all over and get, get a little help here. We can look and we can say, okay, I've got my work in progress here. I see how old it is. Now let me understand what that means. And we can see that 85% of our past work here took 16 days or less. So if I focus on at least keeping that static, you know, what if I manage my items so that uh, only 15% of items finish beyond that date. Then my 85th percentile, my forecast I can make for people will stay consistent. It'll be predictable. Now, if I stop caring about how old things are and more and more and more items finish beyond that 16 days, uh, because when the items move to this last column, they become a dot on that cycle time scatter plot. Right? They're a historical data point at that point. Right now, these are all leading indicators of the eventual dot, right? Right now is the only time we can control where that dot will land in our historical data later when it's still in progress. So if I let more and more dots go beyond the age that I'm trying to use as a forecast, then I'll no longer be able to say that 85% of my items can finish in 16 days or less. It's gonna be more like 18 or 20. But the flip side, the, the positive way to look at this is if I take this and I use it for good, I try to improve my predictability. The way to get that line to move down is to finish more than 85% of items by that date. And the reason why width limits alone are not enough is let's look at this second column here, analysis done. Let's forget that it says done right now. But let's assume that this is a column and we have a width limit of five, okay? And I, let's say these two top dots are blocked and I'm just gonna ignore them. I'm gonna let them sit here and get older and older and older, right? But yet I'm cycling through these three other dots. I'm like, I'm getting those done, pulling three new ones in. I'm staying in my whip limits. No alarm bells are going off, right? But yet I am ruining my predictability, which makes it harder and harder to forecast in a way that is best for uncertainty. So that's why I say that even before whip, age could be more important because when I look at things are getting older and older, that might actually lead me to adopt with limits, but it's unlikely to maybe go the other direction. So there's lots of things you can do about age. But the gist is, is that we have to, um, we have to start thinking about our predictability and how to improve that so that we can give forecasts that we're happy with but that are also risk, uh, risk aware and reliable. There are a couple of thinking traps that you probably will come up against if you haven't already when you think about adopting this. And the first is that I don't have enough data, but the good news is that you have, you need much less data than you think. In fact, you might only need as few as 10 finished items to start forecasting with probabilities. There's no magic number that I can give you that works for everyone because it depends on your context. But the, you know, as long as you can get enough finished items that represents the variety of work that you do, then you have enough. And the other thing to remember is that just keep continually forecasting. This isn't a one and done. It's like your GPS. Um, it keeps reforecasting as you drive and meet new challenges. And so your data will do that too. And the last thinking, trap is, I can't do this because not all my stuff is the same size or the same type, but you shouldn't have to expect to, right? Trying to make everything the same type will introduce more problems than it solves. Um, but you can, um, 
remember the fact that the probabilistic forecasts that you use based on your data account for all that variation. They were generated while you had the capacity you have, while you had the different sizes of work that you have. So it naturally accounts for all of that. You only have to worry when your conditions change and then only until you generate enough new data. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and you can come by my uh, booth to talk more about it. But the things that I really would love for you to take away is that if there's more than one possible outcome, then you really want to be thinking in probabilistic terms. And those probabilistic forecasts have two components, a probability and a range. Picking the probability is very contextually driven. And even once you start, it may take a lot of effort to stay in a probabilistic mindset. You have to keep looking out for those thinking traps. So I did wanna leave a few minutes for questions and beyond the booth here are some other ways to engage with me. So I'll leave this up while I check and see if anyone has any questions that I can answer in the next three minutes. Are you a fan of no estimates too? Um, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily calling it no estimates because I think that um, sometimes you have to answer these questions, but I am a fan of getting the best information with the least possible effort. And if I can get a forecast that's based on actual data I've produced, um, that's as accurate as someone sitting down and spending hours and days, and that's a win for me and I can answer their question and not spend a lot of time on estimating. And does that mean that your team is not estimating in story points and days and, and whatever measure relative estimates, you only use your historical data and in that way in context you forecast? Yeah, for me, story points is, we spend so much time saying that story points aren't related to time, yet then we try to take them and use them for estimating the time it will take to do work. And it's very, it just doesn't make any sense at all, right? And I have a lot of people who have shown me data that if they have 10 five point stories, they can take wildly different times, right? So I think if you, there's a guy named Larry Maccheroni and he used to work at Rally. He's a data scientist and he did some um, research based on comparing forecasting with story points and with throughput, which is the rate at which you finish work. And um, it was, there wasn't any greater benefit from trying to measure with velocity or story points. And that takes so much extra work. So for me, it's better if it's either more accurate or as accurate, but takes a lot less effort. And so what I say is that story points can be great, but I don't use them for forecasting. If you wanna use story points to have a different benefit, like understand the work and drive conversations, I'm all for it. Cause I think tools are great for the right things, but they can't be both about time and not about time at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, will, um, I will try to somewhere find Larry Maccheroni's link and, and send that out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for coming to the talk.